So yesterday, I talk about restless mind, worry or regret or then I talk about the things how is it like how does it build up what is it or what is the characteristics of this restless mind that I said that this is a kind of a thinking mind that it doesn't stop it just carry on and on and on and sometimes a lot of it, and it comes it tag along with a lot of unwholesome uh, many other defilements Then, as a, as, a, as a vipassana meditator, we also need to differentiate between just what is not a normal thinking mind and a restless mind. A normal thinking mind that when you pay attention to it, it disappears. But when it's a restless mind, you pay attention to it, it will still carry on. And so we need to learn to deal with it. Uh, uh, we need to learn to deal with it in order for it to disappear. But to do, do it, we need to do it in a skillful, wholesome manner, not suppressing it. If we suppress it, it will boomerang back, then it will hit us even more, uh, more problems. Yeah. So, here, as I said, in the first thing, we need to acknowledge it. At least there's some degree of small mindfulness that we are already aware that is already there. Uh, if you cannot aware of it at the first place, then you'll be caught up in all the stories and all the content of the past, present, or future. Then, when you're able to acknowledge it, then we must able to see it as it is. That means we begin to label it as it is, if you can. Because if you are not familiar with it, uh, then you know that this is a characteristic like that, then you label it uh, restless, 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 or thinking, 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 or planning, 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 or memory, memory, memory. Uh, uh, the, third top, the third thing is that you must learn to accept them. The acceptance of it is a very difficult part. Because a lot of times we are overwhelmed by this restless mind, thinking mind, and so on. And when you come to a meditation center, when you start a meditation, after a number of days, you see that sometimes the restless mind can go on and on. Uh, then it can, it can able, it will sort of like negatively affect the yogi. Uh, but the yogi here is, about, is all about acceptance of it. Because acceptance of it is part of mindfulness. Without acceptance to these hindrances, then you will have a lot of problem. Yeah? You're, going to, you're going to learn, you, you will suppress them by anger or dislike, by ego and so on. Yeah? Then, if you're able to accept them as they really are, uh, but then it doesn't mean that they will disappear. Yeah? Uh, a number of times, uh, many times, you know, in your practice, a lot of times it doesn't goes into restless mind. The moment you are aware of it, it kind of disappear. That one, yeah, well and good, uh, let it go. Yeah? But when it doesn't disappear, then you must have skillful techniques, skillful ways of overcoming it. So yesterday I mentioned that the first thing is by the way of vipassana. Directly pays attention to it. See, see, see its characteristic, how it changed. How, as if like when, when you pay attention to it, when you are not in the story, you are not in the content of, the, of your thoughts, then you see how it changed one after another. You see one story, it passed through, it passed through, it passed through, it passed through, it passed through. Sometimes, you see how it becomes faster, the changes of the thought, sometimes how it becomes slower. Sometimes it just drags itself through. Uh, there are different characteristics, different speed in the change of this restless mind. Uh, but on the, then on the noting side, when you pay attention to it, uh, 
because of the restless mind is where where a lot of negative where the unbalanced type of effort is there when when there's too much effort here the wrong effort the mind become very agitated uh, very agitated then it goes into restless mind uh, so therefore we need to bring down the agitation to bring down that effort uh, in order to bring down the effort we need to bring the calmness in uh, we need to bring the calmness in in all and yet at the same time the mindfulness and the clarity of the mind is still there not that you become too calm and then you do not know anything at all that also is wrong but calm enough that you can able to see the restlessness passing through so you note it as thinking planning 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 while the object may change a bit faster so this is something that you can try finally <clears throat> finally is about to bring that whole restlessness to come to a stop. Uh, there's the only thing in this whole meditation that you bring to see them how to bring it into a stop. Uh, so this is one way. Uh, so another way is that, by the way of Vipassana also, that here also we don't really uh, pay attention to it directly. Uh, we are aware of it that it just arises, but now you bring your attention to different parts of the body. Uh, say, for example, the in-breath, out-breath. You begin to slowly, gently bring back the mind to the in-breath and out-breath. For a few times, then it goes into thinking again. Bring it back, in-breath, out-breath. So you have to go to and fro, to and fro, to and fro, to and fro, until the mind comes down on the in-breath, out-breath, uh, then later part, when the mind comes down clear, then you go into the rising and falling and see all the tr nature or whatever sensation that comes up again. You stay with it, the in-breath, out-breath for too long, then the mind goes into another extreme. It goes into sleepiness and so on, uh, drowsiness. So we just stay enough for the mind to be free from that restless mind, thinking mind. Uh, uh, then, or, or you can use the rising and falling, or you can use the sitting and touching also. Uh, so, there are a number of ways. Uh, you gently pull the mind back down. Uh, and to continue, there are other ways also we can able to notice this restless mind. Now, here is in the relation with the body. <clears throat> This time you still pay attention to the to the uh, restless mind as it change from one thought to another thought, one thinking to another thinking. Now, after a short while, sometimes you notice that your body starts to tense up. The head starts to tense up, or the neck starts to tense up, or the shoulders starts to tense up, or the the, the kind of like sometimes even you put your hands. Uh, palms together, the palms also I feel like it's all the tension is there. Here, the acceptance part also is important. Yeah? So therefore, right now, you don't go and lose the tension yet. Yeah? Your job is not about losing the tension for now. You pay attention to the how the restless mind, then you notice the tension. You notice the restless mind, you notice the tension. Restless mind getting more, sometimes the tension also getting more. Sometimes the restless mind getting less, then you can see that the, the tension also starts to relieve itself. It, it starts to let go. And then sometimes it increases again, you feel that the tension also build up. It may be the forehead, it may be the neck, it may be the here and there. So here, uh, a lot of times, uh, yogis do it wrongly. Because every time when this tension comes up, what usually a yogi do? You would tell yourself, ah, relax, ah, relax, relax. You tell yourself, relax. You want to relax everything off. Not to say that you are wrong, but you are not really doing it right. Because you are not seeing the connectivity, the connection between the restless mind and the tension that is appearing in the body or the pressure that appearing together when it comes, they comes together. 
When they disappear, sometimes both of them disappear together. Here, when you begin to see the interrelation of them, then you see the conditional aspect from one object to another object. We may think that, you know, a lot of times you may think that what is, what is the big deal about noting in this way? You know, if, if, if you're not out there, if you're not a meditator, you may think that, sure, of course, when, the, when the, you, you work a lot also, there's a lot of tension also. You know? When you go out for work and think and think and think, there's also a lot of tension, a lot of pressure also. So what's the difference between out there and inside here? You, as a, as a thinking a lot, there's also developed tension. There are two big differences here, and yet a yogi usually don't see it. Because when you're out there, you, don't, you see it as with an eye. I am thinking and I am having the tension. You don't see the conditional aspect of it. Here, we see the non-self aspect of it. Although it gives rise to the same thing, the condition is the same, but when you pay attention to it, you see it from the perspective of non-self. That is a major thing, although when you're out there and inside here, it looks the same thing. But the perspective of looking at things is very, very opposite from one to another. Uh, from your, when you're out there and when you're inside here. So that's why whatever that arises in this body or in this mind, even that little tension that you have, even that little movement, little, and uh, your, your body also tilted one side and so on, don't underestimate them because they are sometimes, if your mind is clear, they are part of the whole development of insight. So, you take notice of them. When you take notice of them, you learn to accept them. Then you don't learn. You don't put, try to push them away. You begin to embrace them as, as they really are. Then you see the whole connectivity. Then you find that the mind is at ease with all this restless mind and tension. With the clarity that arises slowly and slowly, this restless mind will start to fade off because the mindfulness begins to take over the mind, not the restlessness anymore. So if you're able to do that, it's a wonderful, wonderful skill that you can have. Sometimes also, not only this tension that you should not just shake it away, you know, not, not just not just pull it away, but at times you must learn to embrace the tension, pressure, and see how they are all connected within this body. Uh, there will be times also sometimes, uh, like sometimes you are doing sitting. Uh, when you are doing sitting, sometimes like your body is bent a bit, slightly bent forward. Every time, uh, especially new yogis, uh, bend forward, quickly must pull it back again to straighten. Uh, bend a little bit, also want to pull it back again. Bend a little bit, want to pull it back again. That also is not very right, actually. Uh. I, mean, I mean, if, if it's just a one, one hour sitting for, for, you know, for throughout the whole day, you know, it's just one time, maybe you're not too wrong. But for a vipassana yogi, if you want to go deeper, even that little bend that you have, uh, that is slightly forward that you have, you should not put it back again. Because sometimes, sometimes you will see that sometimes it, you, you try to pull it back again, it will bend forward. Then you try to pull it back again, try to bend forward. Your whole intention in, in, in your, inside your mind is that you want to sit upright straight. Sui sui, you know. Nice. Are beautiful, upright, straight. So everybody look at you, oh, ah, wonderful. Ah. That's your whole intention. But you are not seeing the truth. You, you are taught to sit straight. Yes. In the beginning starting, you're taught to sit straight. Yes, you sit straight. You sit proper. But as you become, the mind become more clearer, there are forces inside the body. It's, it's pushing on the body here and there. The wind aspect, the wind element is trying to push the body. Sometimes the side a little bit, front a little bit. If you bend a little bit, 
it doesn't disturb your noting. Keep it there. You should not go and disturb, you go and catch out the whole thing. Yeah. So sometimes you see a yogi bend until like that, huh? you don't go and laugh at the yogi. Huh? You can demerit uh, all the unwholesome merit all there. People are trying to be mindful here, very clear. And yet you try, you see, like, you look at that yogi. Oh, Ben, what type of yogi is this? Oh, you think you're pandai, uh, you think you're smart enough. Uh. A lot of times we don't really understand because we always think what is right. We don't see what is happening right in front. We we always think that this, this bending is not right for me. Yeah, all, all this, all your thinking. Yeah. So a lot of times, all this small little thing, uh, we don't take note into it. Therefore, a lot of times, our mindfulness keeps breaking. If we just stay there, with the body is bent a little bit, slightly bent a little bit, then it's okay. You know? uh, if so happens, it bends too much, let's say, and then it affects your mindfulness, it affects your clarity of mind. That time is the right time for you to make an intention to straighten up the body in order for the mindfulness to become clear. Other than that, if, the, if, you, if it doesn't affect the body, just stay, stay there a little bit. So sometimes you may see that some yogis may sit bend a little bit, sideways a little bit. It's perfectly alright. This body is totally imperfect, but yet you want to make it very nice, very good. Some yogis are a very straight posture. They are more interested in the straightness of the posture rather than the rising and falling or whatever that's appearing. They are always sort of like straight or not. Yeah, close the eye. <laughs> Every five, ten minutes, I keep on looking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now come back to the restless mind again. Yeah. Now, in this restless mind again, yeah, now, if you have samatha practices, samatha practices is a wonderful practice. If you have time to do some metta or karuna or mudita or upeka or other type of samatha meditation, if you can spend time with it for a while and repeatedly you do it, sometimes it's going to be very useful for you when it comes into dealing with this love, uh, sorry, this restless mind. Because by the nature of samatha, it gives rise to that certain degree of calmness. That calmness is also very useful when your everyday life. Now, you see, in your everyday life, you, you thought that you always to do vipassana, vipassana, vipassana. And, and I know that sometimes you sit down there, your mind is even not clear for that one hour. Uh, sometimes blur, blur, sometimes clear, lah, you know. But you try to meditate. Uh. Now, sometimes what you can do is that you change a little bit. You change to metta, for example. You've been taught to do metta in other places and here. Then you bring up that metta. Spend, for example, you half an hour to do a metta. May I be free from harm and danger. And you try to develop it sincerely, carefully, and then you truly mean what you go through. You know? Sometimes, a lot of times, yogis just, may I be well, may I be happy, may, I be, may you be well, may I be happy. But or kosong one, you know, or empty one, you know. You don't really feel for it. If you don't feel for it, there's no meta, only words, only, only labeling. Only, you know? So you must really genuinely feel that you say, if you mentally, you, you mention, uh, mentally you label it as, may I be free from harm and danger, then you must mean it that you are free from harm and danger. If this group of people to be free from harm and danger, then you mean it. You sincerely wish them to be free from harm and danger. Uh, if let's say after that they get knocked something, eh, that's not your fault, you know. Not, not because your, your meta is not effective. That is their karma already. Your job is just to radiate. Yeah? Radiate that wholesome, uh, that, that happiness uh, here. So, now, 
And then in everyday life, when you are doing, you know, when you are driving, when you are in your office, when you are doing these things and doing that, then you can always bring that meta into the everyday life. Instead of sometimes we, 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 we use those everyday life to argue with others, to be jealous with others, and to be judged in others, and you go to your office, you see, nothing but all the unwholesome mind. Sometimes you go even not only, not only in the office, sometimes you come in a temple or so, you look at, look at others, you want to judge them. What is she doing there? How come talk to the monk so long? What did she bring? What, she bring more than me, huh? You know, all the judgment mind. We cannot be happy for others, you know. We have to judge people, we have to opinion and all this thing. These people do that, that people do that, and all kind of things, you know. Of jealousy around here. And every big temple. <laughs> Not just around. As long as a human being is there, the defilements are there. So what I'm trying to say is that try to fill up instead of all your nonsense in your mind, fill up with some wholesome mind. Fill up with metta, fill up with compassion, fill up with some mudita, fill it, fill it up with some you know, sense of urgency. If you're able to do that, it would be very helpful for you. Instead of going into thinking of all kinds of nonsense. Uh, uh. So in that change, it will take you an, a certain time over a period of time when your mind is so much more softer, so much more pliable. Uh, so much more softer, so much more pliable, then it be, your restless mind throughout the day becomes much more less. And yet, when you need to think, you can think with precisely, carefully, without going into all kinds of tension and overthinking and overjudging over, and so on. Yeah? Uh, so, so, if you have a chance to develop some degree of metta, that would be very good. Some degree of samatha meditation, it is very good. But my, my um, advice is that you don't get attached to it. Yeah, just for the sake of mental development, not the sake of attachment to the... To the um, to the calmness and the pleasantness that comes together with it. Yeah. And sometimes also with the metta they thought that they have, and then sometimes if they're not careful, the ego also come up, you know. They think that I got more metta than you, you know. <laughs> yeah. You see, all these people they are very angry, they don't develop metta. They should develop metta like me. You know? And again all the ego also come in. Yeah. So if you're not careful, this the the the, the, the defilements also kind of could able to come in. Yeah. So, my advice to you all, um, do some metta, do some samatha meditation, interchange with your vipassana. You know, if you don't do it a metta or all these things too deeply, but do it more generally and then do it more frequently. And then it will be very helpful for you to make the mind more clearer and softer. Then when you, next time when you come to a meditation, uh, then the mind is so much more ready for the meditation, for vipassana. Because it's softer, it's easier, and, it's e and the mind is more open, uh, less stress, less problem, better condition for the vipassana to develop. Yeah. <clears throat> now, there are also when it comes with the restless mind. But you see, restlessness, udacha, restlessness is a very, is a quite, in the Abhidhamma, is what we call a common or, or a universal defilement, a mental defilement. Because this restless mind, it comes with every defilement. When you are greedy, your mind is still very active, you are thinking a lot. Uh, when you're angry, also the same thing. When even you're sleepy also, uh, next time when you're sleepy, you see that the daydreaming, you do not know what you're thinking. Uh, you're kind of like passing through a lot of thoughts. Uh, uh. So, so a, lot of, a lot of times when you are having jealousy or even wrong view or anything, the restless mind goes with it. Uh, it's, either whether, it's either whether it is more 
the front or sometimes behind. Uh, but it comes together. So when the defilements come in, sometimes they come in as a group. They don't just come in just because you are having a desire for the food. doesn't mean that it's only desire, but the background also is there are restlessness of the mind. That's why the mind is become wild and active at this time. Uh, so, so too when you are worried about your past, or, so you, or you regret about your past, when you say you regret, when you regret is that something that you have not done. Something that's supposed to be you are supposed to do, but you have not you didn't do it. Then in the future you regret it. Uh, then you're not supposed to do, you did it. Then you regret in the present. You see? That is what we call regret or worry or udaj or kukucha. Pali word, uh, you regret. Uh, so here, when there is a regret there and a the guilt is there, then again, when you do, do into your practice, then the state of mind also comes up. The restless mind, the, st- the story will keep on going and going and going. But this time, it sometimes it tag. The sadness tag along with it. And the sadness sometimes can be very overwhelming very grieving, very, very, very heavy inside that. Yeah. Something that you are supposed to do but you didn't do, but then you regret. Yeah. Suppose you need to say sorry to other people, maybe to your parents, you, you, you talk, but then pass away. Then here you regret. Then you sit, then you cry, cry, cry. Yeah. There are a lot of times we go through those type of things. A lot of times we... we, we Sometimes also, there are past memories that we do not want to see anymore. Kind of like, in certain part of our life, we want to cover up that memory. But when it comes into Vipassana, that's the thing that it, it begins to uncover everything, whether you like it or you don't like it. Because when the Vipassana becomes clearer, uh, becomes more deeper, the mindfulness becomes clearer, concentration becomes clearer, your memory of your past also becomes clearer. As if like those things that you have not thought of it in outside there, then when you come in here, it kind of like open up and shows you very clearly what you have done. And sometimes also we try to manipulate the story to cover up. Yeah. Uh, nevertheless, nevertheless, this time, ta- but no, this type of state of mind. For some people, it affects them very much. It affects them very much. Every time you think about them, cry. You think about somebody died, some pa- your parents died, cry. Every time you talk about it, cry. Every time you talk about it, getting angry. Every time you talk about her, you get jealous. Every time you talk about her, you want to kill her. Or whatever, you know. <laughs> or anything harm towards her. Or you get sad, or you get worried, or you get you regret. A lot of things, it gets connected with it. Every time you sit down there, those thoughts affect you. It can last for an hour, two hours, and so on. You walk, sit, next day, it still come back again. So it's very hard for us to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the same technique, when these things, we need to deal with it. If we don't deal with it, it's going to be very strong in us and it's retreat after retreat, it will affect you. So we have to change it. Now a lot of times we try to suppress it. And this is wrong. We are not here to suppress any of the thoughts. What we are here is that how the mind relates to the thought. That is how we need to change, not the memory. It's not the memory that we are going to change. The memory is part of the whole thing. The Buddha or the Arahants uh, doesn't mean that they have no memory. They have memory about the past. If they have no memory, then something is wrong with them. Mm, dementia, perhaps, you know. Alzheimer. <laughs> uh, then, that is something wrong. It's not about changing the memory. It's about changing how you relate to those memories, uh, those, those sadness and so on. So what do we do right now? So if it, those things arises and it becomes prominent to you, let go of all the other, other objects, then pay attention to it. 
This time, pay attention to it. Again, here, you don't go into the story. You don't go into it and you have to remind yourself, don't go into it, don't go into it, don't go into it. Just see it as just a memory of the past. Uh, uh. While you're noting it this time, the anger, for example, or the, the regret arises. Then you notice it, regret, 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 or anger, anger. Sometimes even you note the regret, the tears arises. Then you note tears, 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 tears. You see how the whole relationship taking place. And you pay attention to it again and again, again and again. In the initial part of it, it is very dukkha, very painful to face these things. But you have to do it. You pay attention to it again and again and again until you, you really know that you cannot do it. Okay, well, at least you try. Here is that you need to try. And the next sitting again, and the following sitting again, perhaps it comes in again. It comes in again, you keep noting it. Sadness, 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 sadness. The memory will just keep on going and keep on going. The sadness or the anger or the regret keep on coming. So you pay attention to it. Uh, so you only pay attention to it in this way. What will happen in future is this. As the mindfulness gets stronger, clearer, yeah, many times when it gets stronger, clearer, then what will happen to this memory or this terrible memory that you may have, they become equanimous. That, that you, when, you, when it arises, next time you note it, the memory is still there, but the sadness is no more. The sadness no more or the regret no more, but this time it's just only mindfulness relating to it. The mindfulness relating to it. So, when the mindfulness relating to the sadness at this time, then the, all this unwholesomeness begins to disappear begin to disappear, it fades away. And every time that, that memory comes in, it doesn't affect you anymore. The anger, the jealousy, the regret is all disappear. This is how you can able to change by paying attention to it. But it's, as I said, it's easier said than done. In the beginning part, it's going to be difficult. But you must persevere. Because when you persevere, whatever thoughts that come in, those difficult thoughts can, can come in, you can able to handle it much more better than before. Yeah? Yeah. So this is why that we recommend to you to pay attention to all these mental states. Don't underestimate them because before you can able to reach or to realize enlightenment and so on, all these state, states of mind, you need to handle them. You need to manage them. Uh, you manage them in order so that this doesn't become a stumbling block, a big hindrance for your progress. Now, as with this, as with this, uh, you are able to mindful and keep on going. Uh, then this type of memory doesn't mean that you don't have it, but it don't because it becomes equanimous and it's not affecting you anymore. It doesn't come in so frequently. Once in a blue moon, you only will come in. Then, because, it's, because it doesn't affect you, it's just like another memory of the past. Hmm? Another random memory of the past. And that time, we just can go on with the practice. Uh, so this time, it is important for us because it will help us to undo, to disentangle a lot of our entanglement inside you know, that we have carried from the past. Uh, so this is one way how we can able to deal with it. Now, there are also at times that there are restless, restless mind that comes in and it comes together with skeptical doubt. Skeptical doubt and the restlessness, they, although both of them also are a lot of thinking, but restlessness, it, goes, it just goes random and certain thoughts, it just go and go. But Vichikicha, or this skeptical doubt, when the more you think on a certain thing, you become, your, your confidence 
or your, your, your sense of your clarity becomes wow, so blur. Then you think that, hey, should I sit or should I not sit? Uh, am I enlightened or not enlightened? Uh, what, did the, what did they say? Oh, yo, am I doing it right or not right? Uh? <laughs> that type of mind you keep going. Uh. And then the more that you think, the more that your mind becomes very shaky. Uh. Your confidence becomes very shaky. Should I meditate? Should I not meditate? Should I go back? Should I stay? Should I, what should I do right now? Uh, yo. <laughs> that type of mind. Uh. Uh, that type of mind is what we call a skeptical doubt. Yeah? But it comes with a lot of thinking. It, it, a lot of question mark inside there, but cannot be answered. Cannot be answered. Huh? Uh, so this, this skeptical doubt also, uh, we need to address them. Again here, now, skeptical doubt is one of the, one of the worst hindrances. Because this skeptical doubt, when it arises strongly, you will pack your bags and go back on it now. And you will not come back again. Huh? Just like, for example, pain. After noting pain, 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 huh, if you are wrongly able to know, how come so many years already I meditate, still got pain? One, huh? Then my friend meditate so nicely, no pain. One. Cannot be one, all right? So something wrong with me huh? or something wrong with the method. Then all the skeptical doubts kept coming in already because nobody guide them. Then they entertain those type of thinking and one of these days they give up on meditation. And many of them are like that, honestly. And many of them over the years also have seen uh, they walking, sitting, and then all kinds of tension arises in the body. And then what they say is that they don't blame themselves, they blame the method. That method of meditation uh, is wrong. This Mahasi method gives rise to all this type of tension. How could it be? You know, meditation should not be all this type of tension. They do it wrongly, but then they're doubting the method. And then after that, they do all kinds of very easy method. Okay, sit down. You want to drink coffee? You can drink. You want to drink tea? You can drink. Anytime you want to drink, you want to sit? You sit. You don't want to sit? You don't sit. You want to walk? You walk. As you like. Then when you do that, sure, there's no tension. Very pleasant, very nice to do. Yeah, carry on like that. Perfectly all right, you know, up to them. You know? So, a lot of times uh, the doubt when it comes in, uh, if you keep entertaining that doubt, you're going to be careful. You're going to have a problem. But there are, of course, there are certain doubts. If you're not sure, therefore, you need a remedy with it. And one of the best remedies, you need some people or some instructor or some of uh, your good friends, you need to clarify, you need to open up. You need to open up your open up your doubt to them and then they help, hopefully they will help you to overcome these doubts. Uh, uh, so one of the another thing is that you must also read. Uh, of course you must read properly. Uh, if something you're not sure, you gotta ask. Uh, uh, in the beginning of the practice, there's a lot of doubt. You're not sure whether you should, you should walk like that or you should walk like that. You should go here or you should go there. You should do this or do that. A lot of times, there will there be, be, be doubt inside that. Yeah? Now, one of, the, one of the things, if you have doubt, and at, some, at certain times, you may not be able to access to an instructor or a teacher yet. Yeah? What I can tell you is that, first of all, as best as you can, clear the doubts away. Clear the doubt away in the sense that bring the mind back to the, uh, bring the mind back to the body. If you are noting the mind, let's say the mind is like chi cha cha chi chi cha cha, is this the right meditation object or not the right meditation object? How come the meditation object is appearing in this way? Is it right or is it wrong? How how can it be? If you are not very sure, uh, come back to your main bodily object. Come back to your primary object. When you come back to your primary object, when you are comfortable with it, a lot of times those doubts will disappear. And then later part, when you are able to access to a teacher or an interview, then we can able to discuss about it. You can open up and we can discuss and clarify. Uh, so, so a lot of times you may not able to access to a teacher, so you must learn to push the, all your question mark aside. 
Don't try, don't try to attempt to answer your own questions. A lot of times, we, just because you have a little bit of knowledge, you want to try to do to, to, to all the question mark inside. You want to fill up with all the answers inside. Your own opinion, your own judgment. So this can be dangerous. Yeah? Yeah. So, put it all aside, those, those questions. Come back, come back again, come back again to the body. The body is more safer compared to the mind. Yeah? It's a safer object because the body doesn't think. Mind thinks. Yeah? So this is one of the few things about restless mind you know, that you need to overcome them together with other defilements also, other hindrances. But prevention, prevention is also another thing we must consider it carefully. Not just trying to overcome and overcome only when it's there. Prevention. One of the biggest problems with restless mind, uh, it comes up, is because of your communication. You actually communicate with another yogi or a teacher or even, even to your mobile phones, your internet, your tablets and so on. Uh, sometimes you may realize uh, once in a while that after interview, you go back and sit and say, inside there. <laughs> because there's conversation, there's, there's discussion going on. But, of course, that, you, that sometimes for a short while, it kind of disappears. But sometimes, yogis, when there's certain places that I've gone to, then when they don't have, then they, when the teachers don't emphasize on to be quiet, you know, they are not supposed to talk with each other, and so on. Then, if they don't emphasize that, then we actually see that the actually the yogis come in, you know, go to the room and start chit chatting and all that thing and so on. After that, they want to come into sitting. The mind is so restless. So sometimes a small conversation of five minutes or so it can give rise to five hours of restless mind. Uh, so as best as possible, when you are in the actual retreat. Forget about talking with others. As best as you can, you need to give up on conversation with others. If you need to converse with others, uh, keep it short and simple and keep it mindful. Be aware of your talking. Be aware of your intention. That what you want, as you finish, that you do those things, uh, keep your mouth shut already and carry on meditating. Uh, Nowadays, of course, with our tablets, with our mobile phones, and this is a big problem. In, every, in almost like every places that I've gone to, the teachers uh, start to take up your handphone, you know, mobile phone, you know, your toys, you know. You, know, you, can, you cannot play with all your toys anymore. And they, they put them in a safe. There are places who, do, who, who, who did that, you know. So far, I haven't done it yet. But who knows in the future, you know. There are places uh, I've seen again uh, because they, are, they thought they are smart enough. So they bring two handphones, uh, two mobile phones. They give one to them and one they keep. You know, we also know what, what, what the, all the nasty things that they are doing inside there. So what for? You know? And you know my style already. You, you, you can always circumvent it. Yeah. Finally, it's your own retreat. It's not my retreat. You cannot progress. It's your own fault. Whose fault is it? I'm happy. My job is come and teach me. If you do not want to follow it, it's your business. If it happened for me to catch you, that's it. I'll just send you to the gate. That's it. What's the big deal about it? I don't going to go and think about it. This, finally, it's your own retreat. So if you don't realize that it's your own retreat and then you want to go and do it for your, all these things, your restlessness come in, your progress doesn't come in, that's your own fault. My job is interview, uh, thinking, uh, I help you, Anila, calm down. But then after that, you're thinking again, uh, whose fault is it again? Your fault already. Yeah. So finally, it's your own retreat. 
This is your own retreat. This is not my retreat. We create a condition for you to come and you make use, the best use of it. Uh, so it's good that all these things, as I said, put it all aside. Communication, you put it all aside. You take your meditation more, a bit more seriously. If you don't do like that, no matter how many teachers you are in, uh, their attitude is trying to meditate a few hours, then you must go and check your WhatsApp. <laughs> must check your internet. Must check your what, what is in the office. Uh, and all that thing. Habis. Gone. All your mindfulness. Uh, then restlessness is going to be a lot. Another, another thing is that the restlessness is that I said, you need to slow down. Slowing down of the body is also very helpful. Helpful in the sense that if you rush, your bodily movement, if you keep on rushing, it conditions the mind to think very fast. Therefore, it goes into restlessness. So here, while we are here, how slow is slow and how fast is fast? The slowness here is all depends on the condition of the mind at this moment of time. So you must not be as fast as you are outside there. You must be slow enough that the mind can able to follow comfortably. If you go too slow in your daily activities and all the things that you are doing, if you go too slow, the mind, the mind becomes very stressed and the body also becomes very stressed. And that also is not right because the mindfulness is not coming in. But if you go too fast, then you, then you are rushing again, the mindfulness doesn't come in. So therefore, you must, at that particular time, you must learn to be a bit more slow. Uh, so sometimes there is a bit slower, there's a bit faster, a little bit slower. Sometimes the, the speed may change a little bit according to the time of the day, according to the situation. So you slow down. Uh, you don't swing your arms, you, put your, 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 you, don't, you don't look here and there, keep your eyes down here. Uh, then it's going to be very helpful to you to prevent the restlessness from coming in. These things I've mentioned the first day. Uh, the first talk, usually I have to remind yogis, but I need to wrap it in. <laughs> uh, I need to wrap it in until you realize that how important those things are. Uh, all these small, small things, don't underestimate it. Uh, uh, then, again, your daily aspect, your daily mindfulness, then you have to bring in the mindfulness towards that you are noticing the opening door, closing door, and so on. Uh, those mindfulness, because... When you have that mindfulness, it prevents all kinds of thinking coming in. Now, with that daily mindfulness that you have, that, that daily chores, and you'll be mindful, eh? even if you're eating mindfully and so on, by, let's say by 12 o'clock or by, by 1 o'clock, without doing much of a walking meditation, you are very ready for the sitting meditation because the mindfulness has really built up on the other aspect of what is going on. Uh, other aspect of your life eating, showering, brushing teeth and so on, by the time you do all those things, uh, one o'clock you come in you are ready for the, this one you don't worry about, one day, not enough walking uh, one day on. <laughs> you, should be, you should be ready, you think that all your eating, no need to be mindful all these things is part of the whole whole thing, whole aspect of it, so you've got to be ready for it yeah uh, so, so these are some of the things huh, we, we need to look into. Huh? <clears throat> All right. Now, <clears throat> we look into a bit into the next aspect of the hindrance. Huh? We take a look at sloth and topper right now. Huh? Now, sloth and topper here is the opposite of a restless mind. Restless mind is, is one of the restless mind. Restlessness is because the energy is wrong energy and it's too much. It's too much, it gives rise to agitation of the mind. Whereas when the sloth and topper is there, it, you don't have the right effort or lacking of the right effort. Okay? Restlessness is because there's too much wrong effort. Yeah. If you have right effort, proper effort, then it doesn't go into, into restless mind. Yeah. 
if you have lacking of the right effort, then it could, then the, the sloth and torpor will creep in. It's one of the factors. Uh, uh, therefore, in the restlessness, we need to calm the mind down. But in the sloth and torpor, the drowsiness, we need to increase the effort, the right effort. Uh, so how are we going to do it then? Now before we look into it, let's look into what is sloth and what is torpor. What is tina and what is mida? Yeah? Now, according to the Abhidhamma, tina, it affects the consciousness. Mida affects the mental factors. Uh, what does it mean here? What do you mean by affecting the consciousness? Affecting the consciousness means that your consciousness becomes not clear. When it comes in, your consciousness, your awareness becomes very blurry like that. And blur, blur, nothing clear, nothing this one. Whereas when it affects the mida, when it says it affects the mental factors, means that it affects, the, let's say, the mindfulness, the concentration, the wisdom factor, you know, the effort, the energy. When it affects them, it makes them lose their function. It lose their function. That means the concentration will lose its function. It kind of like cannot able to hold on to the object properly. It keep on dispersing. The mindfulness lose its function because it cannot really see face to face with the object, it begins to lose its function. The penetrative mind of a wisdom factor also loses its function, it becomes very weak or not clear at all. This is Abhidhamma. Lah, yeah? So it's not easy for you to go in. Hey, this one Tina or this one is Mida right, coming in? Uh, is, am I affecting this and that? All you see is all darkness on it. <laughs> Oh, you see, it's all heaviness at this time. Huh? Um, so, when it affects, it, just for, us, for, 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 for knowledge's sake, it affects different aspects of the mind. But when it comes, they come together. When they go, they go together. Okay? When they come, they, both of them come together. This is two different aspects of a defilement. Uh, two kinds of defilement. But because they come together and they affect the same thing, the same, the same way of overcoming it also. Therefore, the Buddha put it as a hindrance, a single hindrance, but two types of defilements inside there. All right? Uh, two types of defilements inside there. Uh, so a single hindrance. So, so here, here these two, now these two when it comes in, it affects the yogi. Most of the time what you see here is that the sleepiness, very heavy type of sleepiness, heaviness of the mind, the, the mind kind of like sink into a beast, dark and gloomy inside there. Uh, uh, so this is the, when it becomes heavy. Uh, but this is what of the, most of the time you know it becomes heavy and it's dark and it's not clear. You thought that this is the only sloth and topper that is. There are also other type of sloth and topper that your eyes are actually open, that you are actually alert, but you still have a sloth and topper. You still have tina and mida. That is the weak type of a tina mida. That one, what you experience one is all the heavy type of tina and mida. So both of it also, it's the weak part and the strong part, this both also as a yogi, you also must know their characteristic. Yeah. So, uh, these, these, these characteristics of sloth and topper, as I said, first few days, you're going to have it. First few days when you come into a retreat, you will have this a lot of this sleepiness. Yeah. Then you have to go through it because the sleepiness may come in from the tiredness of your body and other factors also. Uh, your body is not adjusted to the, to the meditation, uh, walking, sitting and so on yet. Uh, so you need a few days for it to adjust. But after a number of days, once in a while also, one or two sittings, there may be sloth and topper still coming in. But compared to the first few days, it's so much more less. All right? But the first, but one or two sittings may still come in. 
Uh, so that that's those sittings, this time we need to deal with it. We need to deal with it. If not, if you don't deal with it, then you get very frustrated. Then the confidence about the meditation also becomes shaky a bit. Uh, uh, so you must learn to deal with it. Uh, so this sloth and topper for a lot of people, especially Chinese, uh, you have uh, less, la. less, because everything, everyone, pia pia pia, you know, that, that, that type of go 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 type of attitude. Uh. So the sloth and topper you don't, but you have the other extreme of restless mind, you know. But once in a while, I do see yogis, but not that many, but kind of like a chronic sleepy sleepiness. <laughs> Every retreat comes. Uh, he, the, the problem of the yogi is not the thinking mind. The problem of the yogi is the sleepiness. But this is a very few compared to the restless mind's thinking. Uh, so this one is very few. Uh, uh. Now this one, what, they have to deal with it more, more, uh, more carefully. Uh, uh. Many parts that I've, I've, I've teach retreat, you know, a lot of people have to deal with more of the restless mind. But certain parts of the world uh, that I've gone to. Uh, Although I don't teach, uh, but there's a lot of laziness in them. Especially the men. Especially the men. Yeah. The women are very hardworking, but the men are very lazy. Yeah. And you, you see a general population. Uh, you see the, the woman is working, working, then the men are sitting in a coffee shop and drinking coffee. <laughs> like lay park there, you know, nothing to do, take a sweet time. Uh. <laughs> in many parts of the world, I like that. If you keep your eyes open, uh, they, are very, they don't want to do anything because they like sit there, relax, and so on. Let the woman do it. <laughs> Let all the women do all the work. Uh, so, anyway. Now, when it comes to this um, uh, meditation, uh, when it comes to this meditation, as I said, all of us are affected one time or another with it. So we need to deal with it. Most of the time, as I said, it's the heaviness type of sloth and torpor when it comes in. So when it comes in this heaviness type of sloth and torpor, when you're beginning to so, mind is so unclear. Just now I mentioned there's two defilements, Tina and Mida. Now sometimes, uh, just, for, just for discussion's sake, uh, sometimes the Tina is more clearer than the Mida. Sometimes the, 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 the unclear part of the mind is more stronger than the non-functional part of the mind. How do you going to put it clearly? Sometimes the, 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 the mida, the, the topper, is more stronger than the mida. But when they, they come together, but one of it can be stronger than the other one. But sometimes both of it can be equally strong also. Uh, that's why sometimes when it comes in, uh, you find that the sloth and torpor, uh, if you begin to pay attention to it and it's heavy, sometimes you feel that it's kind of a different type of sloth and torpor. Uh. Sometimes it's the sloth and torpor, uh, you notice it, is very dark. Sometimes you feel very heavy. Sometimes you feel that the mind doesn't want to work, that type of thing, uh. You're, a bit, you're still alert, but it doesn't want to work. Sometimes you feel that it's kind of like very sinking deep inside. Sometimes you feel like, like your lights of your clarity begin to cover up like a blanket, you know, slowly, 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 slowly cover it. That's it. You start nodding and so on. You know? Sometimes you become heavy, the nodding comes in. Your, your movement of your head comes in, your body becomes slum a little bit. You know? Those are Characteristics of sloth and topper when they become heavy. Yeah. So, so now is that when you pay attention to those things, you see its characteristic. Uh, if it's heavy like that, you notice it's heavy, heavy, heavy. Uh, if it's dark and gloomy, then you know dark, dark. Down. Sometimes you feel that your mind is not really working. You know, not working, not working, not working. Uh, uh, you don't try to try to be smart. Huh? Hey, this one is thinner or this one is mida? Mm, this one is sloth or this one is topper? Let me see. <laughs> don't, 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 don't try to differentiate these two. No, no point, you know. Uh, because they're going to come in in many different ways. Uh, uh, 
But if you want to know, next time, if you, the type of mind, uh, it comes in very blur. Very blur, and then your awareness is very dark. Then this is more like a Tina type. A Tina is a bit more, a sloth is more heavier. That means it affects the consciousness a bit more than the, this one. Uh, sometimes you find that if your mind is not really working, you want to note something, but it kind of like doesn't want to go there. You know that you, you're not fully sl- sleepy, but you're still somewhat alert, but it doesn't want to work. That is more like a Mida type, yeah? a topper type. Yeah? So, this is for knowledge sake, like, you know. But it's interesting. Once you're able to begin to pay attention to this state of mind, it will show you a variety of sloth and topper. And it makes your inter- meditation become interesting. You look forward for sloth and topper next time, you know. <laughs> I hope you don't, you know. <laughs> but it comes in, at least you know how to pay attention to it. You see it's different characteristic. This is how you begin to note the sloth and topper. You begin to enter into the nature of sloth and topper. So too, right now, the four steps that I've mentioned earlier on in the restless mind, this now is equally you apply to it. Equally you apply to it. No, before, sorry, forgot. Before we talk about the step, I want to talk about the weak type of sloth and topper. The, the, the heavy one, a lot of times you see it. The weak one is where it's very difficult for you to see it unless you are alert enough. Yeah? It kind of like that. It doesn't, come as, it doesn't come as that sleepiness, but it comes as the mind is just lazy. The mind doesn't want to work. Although the eyes are open, you're alert, but it just doesn't want to work. You can sit there as if mindfully, but your mind just don't want to do anything. You just sit there. It doesn't want to know whether it's sitting, sitting, or chewing, chewing, or you said biting, but you just your eyes are all open, you know. You can be sitting down there. Then the rising, falling come in. Then what? What is there anymore? You know, the mind just doesn't want to put an effort into it. Uh, that is also sloth and topper, but it's difficult to catch it. Uh, sometimes, like for example, um, you lie on the bed. You know, yeah, it's supposed to be time getting up. Uh, you're like, oh, yeah. give me one minute lah. You know, eyes are already open. Four o'clock already. Supposed to wake up. Maybe a bit for them. Then I let them shower first. Then only I wake up. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> Your eyes are already open, but the sloth and topper is already inside there. Well, sometimes, sometimes, for example, you sit down, you know. Then if you're, you're, you're alert, you're, you're still in a way alert, but the mind doesn't just doesn't want to work. You just want to, just want to sit there and let it, let everything be on you. That is also another name for sloth and topper, but in a big form. So therefore, you must learn how to catch hold of the big form. The weak form type of sloth and topper is like compared to your thinking. You know the thinking, huh? Then it disappears already. You know that time. Huh? This one, if you can able to catch it, you catch it. That sloth and topper, it also disappear. But the heavy one, just like a restlessness and a heavy type of sloth, and you no, 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 are still there. That one is a heavy one. Yeah? But the, the big one is difficult to catch because it's just passing through and it, it thought that it's just okay, wah. nothing, no problem, wah. easy. Wah. Ah, that, wah. that yeah? uh, is the sloth and topper and it comes in a more weaker form. Yeah? So when we're able to differentiate these two, yeah, we're able to differentiate these two and all the, those things and in between. Uh, therefore, when we begin to be more aware of them, therefore it is important for us to overcome them in a more proper manner. Uh, so, again here, 
the four methods. And uh, tomorrow I'll explain a little bit more. Huh? Here again, you need to acknowledge it. That it comes in, you have to catch it first. Whether it's the weak one or the heavy one. If you don't even catch the able to catch the weak one, it will become stronger and stronger and we become a full-blown sloth and topper huh? if you don't catch it. So finally, you need to acknowledge it. At least it is already there. It is already there. It already arises. The first initial contact on the sloth and topper. Huh? So this is the first thing. The second thing, again here, is to label it as sloth and topper. Or you acknowledge clearly this is already arising. So you begin to take note of it. You think to take note of it more clearly right now. Or you put a labeling there. Huh? You put a labeling there. Yeah, very helpful. Uh, lazy, lazy, or sleepy, sleepy, or you note it as uh, 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 dark, 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 heavy, heavy, heavy. I begin to put the labeling there. Uh, the third thing is this acceptance of it. Now, the acceptance of it here, also we need to address it a little bit more because this, this love and topper, if you don't accept it as it is, uh, a lot of times you'll get things as a big disturbance to your meditation. Uh, because the attitude of looking at these hindrances as disturbances. Uh, then, when if we can able to, able to accept it, then we must learn to overcome it in a skillful manner. Uh, uh, so tomorrow again, we're going to look into different skills in order for us to overcome the sloth and topper. Not just overcome it, but we turn it into a meditation object and begin to see their true nature of the sloth and topper. Right? So we stop here for the night. We'll continue tomorrow.